So in the second half of the lecture, we're going to be looking at explicit theories of wisdom or an explicit approach to wisdom. Again, really looking for behavioral manifestations of wisdom or um, looking for how a wise person would react, um, specifically in a situation um, where there's some amount of uncertainty. Uh, there's two ways that you can try and measure wisdom, quote, objectively. Um, you can use self-report measures where you look at uh, certain characteristics of individuals um, and, and at least group them based on if they appear to be wise or not uh, using some of the more implicit theories from earlier or performance-based measures of wisdom uh, where you essentially have a person uh, respond uh, to a certain situation and often you code um, how they describe the type of advice that they would give or um, their assessment of a certain situation. Now, there's a great article that I posted online. It's an optional article, um, but it talks a lot about different measures of wisdom, and it comes to a very simple conclusion that among these measures of wisdom, the correlations are very low, uh, much lower than you would um, hope for. Uh, some of them are actually even negatively correlated uh, between two measures of wisdom. And so any particular measure um, that you choose will really strongly influence the results that you're going to get. If you wanted to measure a self-report uh, wisdom, you wouldn't just ask a person, are you wise or not, uh, but you would ask them questions um, where they would either agree or disagree, or you would give them uh, statements that they can say are, are true to who they are or not. Uh, but again, if you look back at the, the Clayton uh, three different dimensions of wisdom, you see a reflective and effective and a cognitive uh, dimension that can be measured. So again, you're not asking people, um, are you a wise person? But you might ask them um, if they're comfortable with all kinds of people, which would be a demonstration of sort of an emotional dimension uh, of wisdom. In the lecture, though, we're really going to focus on these uh, two prominent explicit theories of wisdom, Bob Sternberg's uh, balance theory, which really looks at uh, wisdom as balance or, or holding sort of competing interest in mind when you're trying to make a decision for uh, the good of all. Uh, the Berlin paradigm, uh, which is looking at wisdom as expertise, um, as um, uh, developed by Paul Baltes and, and his colleagues. Um, both of these measures, or when we talk about performance-based measures, they assess uh, wisdom by looking at um, individuals' verbal responses um, to wisdom requiring problems. So how would you go about trying to look at a performance-based measure? Um, it's not quite as easy as an implicit measure where you just ask people what are the characteristics of wise individuals. Uh, first, you have to have some sort of underlying theory um, describing wisdom um, and how that um, would be manifested in our in our day-to-day -day life so we can actually identify what is to be measured. Um, so if you look back at, at many of the implicit theories, there are at least some small differences between uh, what we think of as wisdom. So you have to define wisdom first. Um, then you have to develop a task that will elicit the behavior that's indicative of wisdom. Um, and then you have to evaluate um, the behavior to see if it is actually assessing uh, people who are or are not wise. So Sternberg's balance theory um, uh, uh, involves making judgments um, you know, when competing interests uh, lack a clear resolution. Uh, so, you know, wisdom can't uh, be a situation where there's really an obvious sort of choice. Uh, so you start with tacit knowledge um, and you sort of have this application of your knowledge and your abilities. Um, and where, really where you see uh, the theory of balance is that um, you're trying to balance uh, your interest and other interests in order to achieve a common good. Sometimes uh, in other theories of personality, um, describe this that sometimes we're only able to get ahead or get along. It's very difficult to sort of balance our you know inter um, and our intrapersonal interest in the same in the same um, in the same way uh, to come up with some sort of common good. So um, how we end up trying to achieve this common good um, is through the, the responding, the sort of selecting and shaping of both long and short-term goals that again keep these um, interests in mind, these competing interests in mind. Baltus and his colleagues really look at um, what is a little bit more famous, the Berlin Wisdom Model, um, which attempts to quantitatively uh, measure subjective 
our subjects uh, wisdom related knowledge um, so there's a couple of pieces of information that are really important um, again remembering that we have to come up with our definition and our criteria so both factual and procedural knowledge are important to demonstrate that you're a wise person um, to uh, show wise performance if you want to think about it that way you both um, need to know um, what to do and, and actually how to, and how to do it um, Balt is uh, emphasized and thought this was exceedingly important um, that you needed to have real life scenarios which a person would respond to um, and that was really the only way uh, to show that a um, you know, person was making sort of some sort of wise decision. So this is a, these are a couple of quick examples that you would actually see if you were to um, uh, uh, take part in, in an assessment of this. Um, so you would actually have a person uh, read the question that's in italics here and reflecting over their life. People sometimes realize that they have not achieved uh, what they had once wanted to achieve. What could a person consider to do in such a situation? Uh, then an individual would write a response uh, to that prompt. Uh, here's another one that is on the Berlin Wisdom Paradigm. Somebody gets a phone call from a good friend. The friend says that she or he cannot go on anymore and that she has decided or he has decided to commit suicide. Uh, what could uh, the person consider or do? What kind of advice can you give? And now you're going to give advice back to this individual who's called you. Um, a 14 year old girl uh, wants to move away from her home right away. What could uh, she consider? And do again you then respond to this prompt um, and and they you either respond uh, by writing or you respond by by telling an interviewer or, or a tape recorder um, what your response is um, and then um, what happens is by responding and thinking out loud to the problem at hand it gives uh, coders an opportunity to look at the way that you are um, responding to these different types of problems. So they're transcribed and basically you look at uh, five different criteria for a person who is demonstrating uh, wisdom. So of course you have to have uh, factual knowledge, uh, you have to have specific details and elements about how a problem is going to be solved, you have to have procedural knowledge, you have to be able to sort of think about grand principles and generalizations of um, you know to be able to, to solve the problem. Uh, you have to have some sort of uh, context. You know, not all situations are going to be the same for the same individuals in the same timeline and things like that. Um, a certain amount of tolerance, you know, acknowledgement of differences of what might be wise for me may not be wise for someone else. Same type of idea that there's this management of uncertainty that you have to tolerate ambiguity. So you need all of these criteria to really have sort of a wise decision. So it's this, this focus on this flexible thinking, this sort of dialectical processing, um, which would demonstrate that a person has uh, wisdom. Um, this might not be easy to read and because of time I will suggest you that you, you pause real quickly and read some of these. Um, but what we have here are actually two real responses. Uh, one is a sort of uh, low, uh, low wisdom uh, related score uh, to the problem uh, earlier about what a, a 14 or 15 year old person should do and a high wisdom. Uh, I, I encourage you to, to, to read those and then go back and look at the criteria uh, and try and think about how um, you would score those. Um, what Baltes uh, finds uh, that's really, I think, to be quite interesting um, is that this wisdom-related performance, uh, first off, at least within an age range of 25 to 75, there's no relation between age uh, and wisdom. So, of course, we know it goes without saying that as you go from being a toddler to an adult, you know, you increase in wisdom. Uh, but at a certain point, then uh, there is uh, little difference in age. Um, there also is um, some ways that you can argue about how a person can become wise. Uh, so Valtes uh, has some recommendations on that. Um, one thing that's really interesting um, is that mentors are really important, but they're, they're, the, the effect that mentors have on developing wisdom is, is often indirect. And the reason that is, is because wisdom is often transmitted not just through sharing advice, which would be a very direct way to, to give uh, wisdom, but to model the right behavior in certain types uh, of situations. 
Um, so uh, as we end this lecture, I want to um, encourage you to sort of think about how uh, you can look at wisdom uh, and remember understanding these sort of cultural and environmental factors that, that are really, really quite vital.